Guardian Radio, your station for up-to-the-minute news, intelligent, interactive, and engaging conversation. 96.9 FM. The views and opinions of the hosts and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the management and staff of Guardian Network. You're now in the Essential Zone, where we seek to be informative, inspirational, enlightening, and dynamic. But more importantly, we seek to be fair and balanced. There comes a time when the game tolerates no spectators, only players. There comes a time when we must recognize that our individual aspirations shape our collective destiny. There comes a time when getting in the game, despite the risks, despite the challenges, regardless of the cost, is simply the right thing to do. There comes a time when we must find our hearts, find our soul, and pursue our purpose for the greater good of all, for country, for humanity. There comes a time when we must manifest our true greatness, yes? There comes a time, and that time is now. So let's get down to the essentials. The essentials. Serious radio for serious people committed to advancing the national conversation. And good evening and welcome to the Essentials Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. I am your host, Hubert Edwards, and you are on the Essentials, the reset. And we are going to have ourselves, as usual, a wonderful conversation. We have in studio a very, very potent guest, someone who, when we get together, regardless of the discussion, I always enjoy it, and I'm sure you are going to do so too for many, many reasons. And so we are going to get right into it. We've been doing this series on in the run up to Independence, Independence 50, a very, very significant moment in the life of any country. But we have kind of stretched it just a little bit. And while we are celebrating up to the 50 years, we are asking the question, what about after? So it's beyond the 50 years. What are we going to do? Are we really celebrating? Are we truly celebrating the things which the country has achieved over the years? Are we leaving out some persons? Are we pushing individuals to the periphery of society? Are we all encompassing? Is the tent, as they usually say in political terms, is the tent really big enough to accommodate everyone? So this evening, we are going to have our conversation. The first evening, we looked at it from a financial services, and we had a talk with Dr. Tanya and Farida Sands. Last week, we had a discussion with Therese Turner-Jones, and we kind of take an economic look, but some broader eco uh, uh, social issues were discussed this evening. This evening, we are jumping off at the point where we should have started, if not for just a few logistics. We are going to start at the religious point. We are going to go into the church. We're going to ask some questions about what the church is doing, how the church is doing it, how the church has contributed to the country, and what the church holds for the future of the Bahamas. And so I have in studio with me, eminently qualified, the son of a farmer, musician, politician, writer, and cultural activist, the one and only, a man who I refer to as the Ubuntu pastor, <laughs> none other than my friend, Pastor Mario Moxie, welcome back to The Essentials. It is so good to be back at The Essentials with you. And uh, of course, yeah, you and I are, are very good friends. And I think we need to disclose that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just in case somebody sends some bias here. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, it is so good to be here with you. Yeah. And so we need to start where we need to start. This is the 50th anniversary of independence, which uh, we are about to embark on, which will be celebrated on the 10th of July. And of course, um, the celebrations are already on, and they're going to go for another year or two. Um, you know, that's what you do when you get to the Golden Jubilee. You celebrate it forever and a day. But as you look back as throughout your life, your human life, your time here in the Bahamas, God has placed you here in this country. As you look back, just from a nostalgic point of view, um, how did you, how have you, how are you experiencing the Bahamas? You know, I, I first of all, thank you so much for having me here uh, as your guest. I look back at, at, at my experience being in the Bahamas, and it's only now as I'm more mature that I recognize how much my childhood has influenced who I am today. Mm -hmm. 
growing up, um, we would have family dinners. Now, when I say family dinners, I'm talking about extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins. Mm -hmm. We would have these wonderful dinners, and they will not just be at Christmas or New Year's or Easter. We would have them throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And um, in my family, there are a number of cultural icons. My Aunt Kayla, who passed away, mm -hmm. uh, was a cultural icon. My father was a cultural icon. Uh, my Aunt Joan, um, also an uh, incredible entertainer, musician. And uh, so and practically almost every other person in, in my father's sibling can play the piano mm -hmm. and sing. Mm -hmm. So when we got together, it was not just eating food. It was playing at the piano and singing songs together. And um, it, it was that full expression of all things Bahamian. Mm -hmm. I grew up with that. And I would go to school the next day, and I would say, oh, we had a good time at family dinner. And my friends would say to me, family dinner, what do you mean? And I would explain, you know, all my cousins and all that. Mm. And, and I would say that they would have no idea of what this would look like because they didn't experience family dinners, much less experience a cultural um, performance at, at family dinner, this and, and when I say performance, I'm talking about a real performance. Mm -hmm. we, we all gathered together in the living room, and they would sing. Someone would recite a poem. This, this was a normal thing for me growing up. Mm -hmm. So you, you take your normalcy, and you realize that this expression didn't happen everywhere. But I, I didn't get that when I was young. I thought this was the, how all Bahamian children grew up. Um, so my my view of the Bahamas is from a very cultural perspective, very deeply rooted, mm -hmm. um, uh, being in performances, uh, plays, and so forth, expressing. So uh, it's natural for me to see the Bahamas from this very rich cultural perspective. And, and I realize that because of that, I have a very strong identity when we talk about Bahamian culture. Mm -hmm. I have a good understanding of what it is. As a matter of fact, we have um, at our church the Edmund Moxie Cultural Show, and uh, where we celebrate all things Bohemian. We have Bohemian artists that come in and so forth. And I had a good friend say to me, he says, you know, out of all the pastors in this country, you're probably the only one that can get away with having a cultural show in your church. Uh, celebrating your father. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. But, but it goes without saying. That's, yeah. that's who we are. Exactly. So I see that in, in the things that we do here in this country. And I see our culture have so much potential of getting mm. stronger and stronger. Yeah. Um, with deviated somewhat from that. And I say that only from the perspective of in our hotels, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, under George Myers, for example, he made sure that there were Bohemian entertainment in all the hotels that he, he was involved in. Um, we don't see that much and that level of it today. Yes. And so there is some drop off um, as a result of that. I, I think our country, especially when it comes to our tourist market, it, there's, a, there's a void of cultural expressions and cultural shows. Uh, for example, there is no cultural evening show in this country and hasn't been for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the one things that, that tourists are constantly crying for. They, they want to see an authentic Bahamian show and there is hardly any available. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, and we, we, we came here to talk to you from your perspective as a pastor, but you have the, the fortunate um, experience of being the son of Ed Moxie. So I have to touch that. It, 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 it's historically relevant in any discussion around independence. The extent to which this circumstance that we are experiencing now, that drop off that you, sp you, you spoke of, the extent to which his dream his idea of that Jumbe village, which would have injected and fertilized and cross-fertilized and create this rich, uh, potent source of Bohemian culture coming from the, 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 the belly of the Bahamas mm -hmm. over the hill. The extent to which that did not fire as he anticipated in his vision. Um, we are kind of experiencing the backlash of that in some way, aren't we? In a major way. And, and the thing is, most people don't recognize it right away. Mm. But any time people don't know who they are, they have lost their identity, uh, they're mm. bound to begin to 
to sponge off of others. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't know exactly where they stand. And we see some of that in our immigration policy. We see why Bahamians react the way that they re react because of that. Jumbe Village is was an expression of Bahamian identity in every facet. It was not just one-sided. It, it was multifaceted. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's difficult to explain the Jumbe Village campus because as you explain it, people begin to think, well, that couldn't be because it couldn't encompass that. Mm -hmm. But growing up there as a child, I, I used to, I, I walked every part of it. Um, I understood there was a, there was an auditorium where there were events that would be held in that auditorium. There was a, a museum there with all sorts of, the first time I saw a gooseneck iron mm -hmm. uh, was in Jumbe Village at the museum. Uh, and, and that's the iron where you put coals in it, live coals oh, in the I coals. Know you, I know what you're talking about. Okay. Okay. Some other people don't know. I know what you're about. <laughs> but, yes, but it, it, it encompassed that. I, yeah. I saw the largest uh, pig in my life mm -hmm. at Jumbe Village because when we had fair, um, those fairs, farmers would come in, they would bring cassawas, the yes. largest cassawa, the largest this. Price the largest. produce. All, all of these things uh, happened there. Mm -hmm. I remember one time, um, Mark Bethel and I, the former worship leader at Bahamas Faith Ministry, mm -hmm. passed away several years ago. Mark and I were very close. And we did a number of conferences, ASAF conferences throughout the Caribbean and the U.S. And as many of them we did, he shared a story with me. I had no idea. He said, Mary, you, you don't realize when I was in college, I got permission to take my exams early because we were supposed to perform at Jumbe Village. Wow. And everybody wanted to perform at Jumbe Village, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to miss it. And I got home in time to make that performance. Jumbe Village was that kind of, of, of center for culture, cultural expression over the hill. Mm -hmm. And the campus was a, was a fairly large campus. One, one of the things um, that, that occurred at Jumbe Village was th this, this, this aspect of um, we used to have these gatherings massive weenie roasts. Mm -hmm. uh, we put the weenies on the stick and there's a bonfire and, and everyone is celebrating and, and we're having a good time, clean, clean fun. I, there was a shopping center there as well. So per persons sold their art, their crafts, their wares, mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. And one day I was there and I was picking off the, the there was a columns, there are columns in the, wall, in the halls made of uh, pine trees. Mm -hmm. And I was picking off the, the bark of the pine tree and uh, one of the ladies there, Miss Jenny, she said, what are you doing with that tree? You're destroying that tree. Your father built this place and you're tearing it down. And I was a little boy, but when she said it, it, it penetrated me so deeply that I, I stood frozen and I started to cry. I, you can see I was visibly shaken mm -hmm. by it. And he came out, I don't know where he was, but he came out, he says, no, Miss Jenny, leave him alone, that's fine. Um, uh, it's okay because when I put the trees there, I figured people would pick it off. And when they pick it off, we're going to put a design on these columns. Mm -hmm. And it blew me away. I remember this so vividly as a child. It blew me away because I said, there's a man with such incredible vision that he's thinking not just now, but he's thinking steps ahead. Mm -hmm. And of course, vindicating his son, that helped a lot too. Yes. <laughs> but, but it's those kind of lessons. Mm -hmm. You know, the only relic of Jumbe Village is uh, National Insurance Building is there now. And they've kept two statues at National Insurance, um, a statue of a woman and a statue of a man. Mm -hmm. They were placed in Jumbe Village very strategically, uh, but they just have them placed in National Insurance and don't understand the significance of those two statues. Wow. And so the next time you, you drive past Jumbe Village, you'll see a statue of a woman and a statue of a man. Mm -hmm. And the intent there was they, they in Jumbe Village compound, they were facing each other. They were not close to each other. Right. They were quite some distance, but they were facing one another. Mm -hmm. And the idea there was any time the men would come home after fishing, uh, they would blow the conch shell to let the village know that they're on their way. Mm -hmm. And so the women would come out to the shore and they would look, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with their hands up to their foreheads to see if they can see the boat mm -hmm. as the man is on the boat blowing the conch shell. That's the significance. It is, it's a story, it's telling of a story of yeah. how the Bahamas was of a back time then. Um, And we miss those nuances yeah, yeah. so easily. You know, I'm... I'm, I'm sitting here and listening to you, and this is really not what we came here to talk about this evening, but we have to. Uh, I, and I'm getting goosebumps because as you speak and I'm envisioning, you are narrating a circumstance which captures 
the essence of what life was. And I would assume that over time it would have evolved with national life. And so it would have captured how it was in the 70s, in the 80s, and up to now. And the, 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 the type of uh, vacuum that we experience from a cultural exp uh, um, um, perspective in the Bahamas, that would have been a, a pool that people go consistently to dip and to mm -hmm. refresh. And that would then have migrate into the rest of the country and certainly spill over into Bay Street, which would then infuse the tourism product that we have now today, which we are saying, well, this kind of sometimes look too American to be bohemian. Yes. And that's exactly what's happening. You know, tourists came over the hill to Jumbe Village and not just in the evening. I mean, there were evening programs, but they came throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Taxi drivers would bring them to the Jumbe Village because that was a cultural center. If you wanted to see the Bahamas back then in the old days and also uh, current Bahamas, you go to Jumbe Village. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the things, I had the opportunity um, to, to go to Hawaii and there is a cultural center in Hawaii. Uh, when I walked through that cultural center, my heart was broken because I saw Jumbe Village. Wow. I saw what Jumbe Village could have evolved to if it was given the, the gas that it needed, the wind that it needed, mm -hmm. it, or if it was just left alone uh, for, for him to continue to develop it. Yeah. But, you know, things, things get in the way. And, um, and we are where we are. And we are where we are. <laughs> we are where we are. And so that was a while ago, and that's a part and parcel of your life uh, as a youth coming up in the Bahamas over the last 50 years or so. Back then, Pastor Mario, the church was the backbone of the country. What happened? The church, uh, by and large, is still the backbone of the country. That, that, hasn't, that hasn't changed. Um, one of the things, when, when we look at a pre-independence, the role of the church and the influence of the church mm -hmm. was mega. Um, we have to recognize that to this day, many of our politicians are sitting in our pews. Uh, they're being influenced by the messages that we preach. Uh, they're, they have audience with our politicians, uh, private audience with our politicians that still influence laws and legislations yeah. to some degree. And they come to count the number of people in your church too. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, may be, that may be part of it. Yeah. Um, you know, interestingly enough, I, I had a, uh, every time I met a, a high-ranking politician um, who's now retired, uh, he would say to me, you know, the church has lost its relevancy. People are not coming to church the way they used to. And I would say to him, when was the last time you've been to Bahamas Harvest Church? He would suck his teeth and say, I'm not talking about Bahamas Harvest Church. Right. But, but the reality of it is there is a grassroots movement um, of people galvanizing themselves to church. And, and I think COVID would have had a lot to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, so COVID, you know, it, it had its, its uh, it was devastating in terms of the, of the national blow, a global blow that it dealt. Mm -hmm. But then in another way, it also brought people closer uh, to their roots and people recognize that they need some spiritual grounding. And so people are still looking to the church. Mm -hmm. um, the church is still growing. The church still has its impact. And so the influence of the church, it may have diminished to some degree, but the, the influence is still very strong in day-to-day -day politics. Uh, the persons who are in our government ministries, and this is, this is something that, that people, we, we speak, and, and then we don't realize that there's a day-to-day -day process of this. The people who are working in government um, may not be the minister, may not be uh, a permanent secretary, but you, you have staff that are working in that ministry that do the day-to-day -day work. These people are Christians. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you can imagine on a day-to-day -day basis anything that's happening in those offices. They're seeking counsel. They're seeking advice. And you, let me tell you where you see this even more clearly. The next time you go to a government event, check and see who's praying. Chances are it's going to be a pastor. Yeah. And if you see a pastor there praying, understand that that pastor has some influence within that agency. Yeah. Just by virtue of him being there. So when, when people think that, oh, the church has lost its influence, that, that is so far from the truth. So 
back in the days, um, pre-1967 majority rule and so on, you could, uh, and, and even before then, um, coming out of slavery and colonialism, you could make uh, a greater grab of the role that the church played in the social movement then. So it was to get people out of slavery and to then uplift persons and then through um, the Baptists and the Anglicans and so on to get education to the massive and so, uh, masses and so on and so forth. It, it is, as, as that relevance diminish, uh, or is it that there's so many other opportunities that, you know, it's not as mainstream as, as, as it was before. The opportunities that you're referring to, I'll tell you what those opportunities are. Part of the reason is when you think of public gatherings, the church back then was one of the only places where you would have a public gathering. So it was imperative that if you have a message, it's going to come through the church if you wanted to reach the masses. Mm -hmm. um, over time, there have been other public gatherings. There's, there's technology, there's media, social media, and so forth. So messages can get out a mm -hmm. whole lot easier without that physical presence mm -hmm. um, of, of, of the gathering. And, and this is something that throughout the ages we've seen, um, uh, you know, in visiting the Holy Land, I've seen Paul, for example, um, I've, I've had the opportunity to go to Ephesus and learned something when I was at Ephesus that, that kind of really crystallized the Bible for me. You know, mm -hmm. the, the scripture talks about Paul speaking at Ephesus, and I'm, I'm trying to reconcile how can Paul speak at Ephesus when those people were pretty much hostile. You know, him having a get large gathering would have been something that was frowned upon until you realize that the gathering that he spoke to was a political gathering. It was a town meeting where they would have these town meeting frequently, and it was in the setting of the town meeting that he spoke up mm -hmm. and he preached. Well, that sheds a completely different light on things. Well, the same thing happened uh, in the early uh, pre-independence, during the pregnancy of our independence before we gave birth to this nation. Uh, the places that, that became very prominent for politicians to get the message out to the masses was in our churches. Mm -hmm. And so many of our pastors who were part of that movement uh, were instruments in getting that message out. Most people don't recognize the prayer meetings, the park meetings, the church meetings that really assisted in the independence movement of our country. And so the church played a very pivotal role then as it does today. The, the legacy of uh, you know, pre-majority movement, the legacy of some of the early freedom fighters, and we still have many of them alive today, the legacy of that group of persons like your father, who was fighting for the Bahamas to become uh, an independent country and to be governed by persons that look like me and you, for the most part. Some of that seemed to have been subsumed by the church in terms of its ability to galvanize persons. And in some ways, the, 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 the religion, if you will, the religion has crawled in the multi-denominations. And in many instances, and this is just a perspective, in, well, in some instances, there is a view that certain issues which are important for social mobility, for equality, and so on and so forth, may be antithetic to the church, or the church is antithetic to them in some way, shape, or form. How do we get to the place where the, 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 the church becomes more of a driver of social equality? Or is, there, or is the church on the right side of these issues? The church is on God's side of, when it comes to these issues. So, and, and that is part of the, the tension that we experience because over time, mm. men evolve, men change. Mm. Uh, the scriptures don't. And so the line that the church has has always been very constant and very consistent. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't evolve. Um, one of my greatest concerns and one of my greatest fear um, if I can be that transparent and vulnerable yeah, uh, without the backlash, um, is that we, we would get to a place in this country where our liberal uh, philosophies trump our conservative views, um, which will only lead to our detriment. Mm -hmm. So it, it's important for the church to maintain these, 
these guardrails, more or less, to keep society within certain bounds. We, we, we want to express ourselves. We want freedom. But we have to also realize that, that freedom comes with a price. It's the same thing with our children. Um, you know, when, when we have small children, they want to be up late at night. Um, and so they want the freedom to be up late. But that comes with consequences. That means that they're not going to have the freedom to concentrate the next day in school. Mm-hmm. So if you want to have the freedom to give your best in school, then you have to go to bed early. And, and it's, it's an either-or situation. Well, the same thing happens in our nation. If, if we want the blessings, if we, if we want to continue to see our, our land prosper, then we have to understand that there's a price to pay for that and there are boundaries this is the reason why the church is, is so strong on, on defining these guardrails, defining these boundaries. Mm-hmm. When we step outside of it, and I'll, I'll give you an example. This is a very hot topic, so, and, and you don't shy away from it. Um, one of the, the issues right now have to do, this is the month of June, and, and everyone's talking about Pride Month and, mm-hmm. and the U.S. raising the, the Pride flag and the LGBTQ plus community and, and the whole uproar. And the church has been very clear on homosexuality. Man has changed over time, as you can see. Man has become more and more liberal uh, to the point where we would allow that to happen and we would call that now good when God calls it evil. Mm-hmm. Well, God isn't going to change his mind. But, but here, is, here is where, where I, we so, um, I would say, where we define those boundaries so much so. God has a plan. We, we, we don't have a better plan for this earth than God. And it doesn't make sense for us even trying it. Mm-hmm. There have been other nations globally who have gone full force into LGBT and, and being liberal with that sort of thing who are now backing away from that because they see something coming down the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, what many uh, nations experience, especially in, in the European Eastern Bloc, is uh, winter demographics. Um, where they see a shrinking population. And the reason why they see a shrinking population and they're now promoting families uh, in those countries, um, and you know, people hear about this sort of thing and don't understand why they're doing it, but in those countries, they're providing incentives for a man and woman to get married and then a greater incentive or tax break if they were to have a child. And by the time they get their second and third child, the margin in their tax break is, is so much higher because this is what the government want to incentivize, simply because uh, homosexuals cannot biologically have children. Mm-hmm. And so because they've embraced it to that degree, they're looking down the road and realize that there's a shrinking population. In Italy, for example, you have older couples who are dying out and don't have children to leave their inheritance. So their businesses are shutting down. They're, they're businesses that are no more because there's, there's nowhere for those, no one to inherit those businesses. Um, many of these countries, like I said, experiencing a winter demographics, you do the math, uh, as statisticians do in these nations, and they realize that their population is shrinking. And so on. And, and, but, of course, people have all sorts of reasons why they're concerned about that. The primary reason is, is it all boils down to money. Boys and money. But, you know, I, and, and that, is, that, that is one of the areas. I, I, I hear your points on that. But there's also, you know, other areas, uh, as we touch on it, which impacts our, our social cohesion, our, the, the, the way we live together, the way man and woman interact. There is, in the Bahamas, the issue of um, marital rape, where some persons in the church says to, for the government um, to move in a particular way. It becomes an affront to the Christian um, philosophy. Uh, other persons don't share that. Um, I'm going to be very transparent. I don't agree with it. I don't believe that it does. I believe um, if, uh, if, if this thing emanates from God and God is love, then, you know, as you, I'm sure you're going to tell me, that a man who loves his wife does not do that. But the, 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 the laws which are guardrails in and of themselves for a cohesive society ought to reflect that. And in, in my view, in this moment, in the Bahamas, it doesn't, unfortunate. Uh, we still have also the issue of... Uh, well, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about that yeah, issue yeah, first. Talk, yeah, go ahead. Because we're on the same page with that, you know. Mm-hmm. The issue that we're having has to do with terminology. That's, that's it. It just has to do with terminology. Mm. What we, when we think about marital rape, what is it that we're wanting 
to cease. What we're wanting to cease is a man, a husband, abusing his wife, mm-hmm. physically, sexually, emotionally. We don't want any man to abuse his wife sexually. All right? Um, so we need to put in the laws to prevent that or to, to cause there to be punishment when that happens. We can easily um, legislate laws for that. that. That's not an issue. And the church is a major proponent for that. Mm. We believe that if a man abuses his wife, whether sexual, physical, or emotional, he should be punished. The issue comes in when we begin to define certain terminology. Like, for example, when it comes to marital rape, the, according to the law, it's when a woman doesn't give consent to a man. Mm-hmm. That becomes problematic. Because now, how do we define consent? in a marriage situation. Yes or no. Yes, and, and, it's, and it's that simple, yes or no. So mm-hmm. when the man says she said yes and she said I said no, then how do we determine who's telling the truth? When a, when a woman says yes and she changes her mind to no later, um, then that becomes a problematic situation. We're talking about just the, this term consent. Yeah. So, so let me tell you what the solution is for that. The solution is for that is an app that says yes, says yes. And this is where society is going. Mm. That before a man engages in sexual intercourse with his wife, he says to his wife, can we have sex? And the wife says yes. And so now to make sure that, that there's consent, <laughs> yes, go on this app and let's put the date and the time in that you said yes at this point in time that we can have sex. That is where, that is how the law states. Now, now we, could, we could say, oh, no, it ain't that serious, but that's what the law is saying. Yeah, but that... I, and, and I get where you're going. Now, let me, now, so let me, no, no, let no, me push no. a little further no, 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 on no, this. No, before you push <laughs> a little further, let me throw this at you. Why then isn't the church, why then isn't the church saying to government, you need to not subject unmarried men to that? The reason being, and I'm glad you mentioned because this is what I was going to next. When, when you have Christian men, and this has been the case, when you have Christian men, Versus secular men. We, Christian men live by a certain virtue and value. Now, mm-hmm. people may frown upon this. Mm-hmm. But the Bible teaches us that, that premarital sex is a sin. Having sex before marriage is a sin. Mm-hmm. Now, I've been a pastor for uh, over 27 years now. And I can tell you, I've married couples who have not had sexual relations before they got married. Mm-hmm. So a, a Christian man would keep himself... The, the entire institution of marriage is about consent. The marriage covenant in and, in and of itself is consent to have sex. Christians wait until they're married to have sex. A secular man who doesn't follow biblical ways doesn't wait to have sex. He'll have sex before marriage. Mm-hmm. So there's a fundamental difference when it comes to the two. And hence the reason why uh, this becomes such a strong point of, of contention from a very biblical perspective. We, we endorse and we encourage people to refrain from sexual activity until such time as they have legal, lawful, God-covenant consent. And you see that as the solution? What I see as a solution related to uh, a husband abusing his wife, Mm -hmm. let's put stiffer penalties in there. See, we can prove sexual abuse, you know. This Mm -hmm. is not about not being able to approve sex. We can prove sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. That is the issue. And if we can prove sexual abuse, then let's put sexual abuse. Let's, let's, let's turn the dial up on if this man abuses his wife sexually, then, then this is going to be the penalty. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking about that. The conversation isn't about him abusing his wife sexually and him being punished. The conversation is, let us just take out some terms in the definition of marriage covenant to say that it's without consent. Yeah. And, and that, 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 that becomes very contentious for the church because the whole idea, and, and any man that, that, that ignores his wife and forces himself on his wife, um, that's abuse. Mm-hmm. So, so if that's abuse. Just call it abuse. Yeah. So, do do you do you agree? Do you agree with a police officer, yeah, getting a complaint that a single man raped a woman? Do you agree that that individual should be arrested, should be brought before the courts, 
and if found guilty, should be charged and maybe imprisoned? Yes. Yes, if, if there's due process, of course. Okay. Why then would you not think that a married person who perform a similar act of the same quality should face the same the same uh, uh, penalty. Why why is it okay for the law itself to give that individual a pass? Isn't the law is not giving him a pass. It is. No, you 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 just you missed the whole point of what I just said. If the man is abusing his wife sexually, he mm. should be punished. That's simple. That's that's not that's not giving him a pass. But but, you, but, but, I, but as the law, uh, you know, and this uh, we, we we're not going to use the whole even for this. But as the law currently stands, it does because it makes an exclusion. No, it doesn't. It does. Any any woman can go to the police and file a report against her husband for abuse. Abuse isn't rape, though. No, but it it she it can be. If I, if if he if he sexually abuses her. Mm-hmm. Then yeah, she can go to t- today. Okay, not tomorrow. My, this is nothing. Not, the, the law don't have to change my, for that. My point, Pastor Mario, is this: Why should a married man be exempted from the offense of rape? Because okay, we we have to differentiate. Rape is that's what I'm asking. I mean, rape rape is sex, mm-hmm. right? It is lawful for a husband. To have sex with his wife. Is it not? Yes. Okay. So, therefore, if a husband has sex with his wife, then he hasn't committed a crime. Let me take this a step further. In many. Oh, no, whoa, 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 roll back one. If a it, husband has sex with his wife, it's mm, not a crime. A, with or without our consent, it's not a crime. If a husband has sex with his wife, I'm, I'm just talking about the act of, of sex, because when we start talking about consent, this is where we get... Are, we, are, are, are we doing this based on the existing laws? Or, based, or from a biblical point of, point of view? Based on, the, based on the laws right now, and from a biblical perspective, mm-hmm. if a husband has sex with his wife, he's not committed a crime. True. Right? True. Okay, so what we would define a, a rape is, according to the law right now, is consent. Mm-hmm. We agree with that. However, the marriage covenant, when, when two people enter into marriage covenant, uh, this, is, this is so profound, right? Yeah. The marriage covenant itself gives consent mm-hmm. to sex. It right. doesn't give consent to abuse. Mm-hmm. Do you follow me? Yeah. So because, now, how do, how do most couples, and we don't need to be graphic with this, right. but, but most couples don't ask for sex they they don't necessarily exchange words. Mm. It's some playfulness, and then yeah, all of a sudden, they don't, they yeah, don't go exactly. sign a contract and thing. Yeah. So 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 then, how do we then determine consent in that scenario? Mm-hmm. Because she never said yes, mm-hmm. and and see, we cannot be so emotional about this topic that we miss these nuances, because we're not thinking on the other side of a woman who says. I have an affair with somebody else and I need a reason to get out of this marriage and I'm going to stick in with this, with this situation because now, you know, I don't have to necessarily prove mm. um, abuse. I don't have to prove anything. All I have to say is I didn't give him consent. And, and if the court can show that he had sex with her, he's in problems. Yeah. It's one of those I'm very... very yeah, but you understand what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, no, because I, sex is, is okay for a husband yeah. and wife. If he has sex with her, she can go and, and file, go, complete I, a, a rape kit. His substance is in her, yeah. and the man is locked up. Yeah. I try to empathize with the church's position because I understand it's, it's really wrapped up in the nuances of what you believe in your philosophy, um, grounded in your biblical teaching. And, now, from, and grounded in common sense. Well... Possibly grounded in common sense, but, you know, common sense not common. And for my part, I didn't get any other common sense. From where I sit, from where I sit, I think I lean mostly to, uh, you know, it should be right across the board. It should be treated as an admin, which if it does take place, then the husband or wife, just like the 
the, um, the, the individual who isn't married should be subject to that. But, you know, it's a, it, it's a discussion I realize which is it, it's so complicated and so complex that we could go at this uh, all night. And, what what, what and happens, what happens in a society like this is we don't, we don't ever look at it from the perspective of how do you enforce this law? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it all boils down. How do you enforce a law like this? Does a woman just pick up and say, "I, I didn't give him consent"? Yeah. How do we? How do we get before we? we now, in a, if she's not married to the man, yes, then of course he's up the creek. He's up the creek. <laughs> you understand <laughs> what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand. But but she she doesn't have to have any kind of evidence. Mm -hmm. All she has to say is, I didn't give him consent last night. Right. So using this as a platform, that and the issue that we talked about before to show how sticky some of these social issues are. How does the, the church marshal itself to help the society navigate some of these social issues? Because we have a number of social issues. In the Bahamas, there is issues around immigration. In the Bahamas, there's issue around poverty. The Bahamas is growing, for example, has grown over the last 40 years. But observation, just cursory observation, suggests to you that there are some persons who are being pushed aside. Um, you know, I have a bit of experience with your church. And the, the church constantly finds itself filling a huge social gap where if you listen to the political director, it doesn't exist, but you see it every day. How do you help to, 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 to talk about these issues, marshal these issues, and to ensure that they become uh, a, a properly, properly managed with a view of growing the country. Not just, hey, we fix this here and we help somebody out there, but it's really part and parcel of part of the problem for national development. How do we do that? You know, I, I heard a story uh, some time ago with this police officer in a small town. He's directing traffic with a World War II helmet, uh, helmet on, his, on his head. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone was asking, well, why are you wearing that helmet? He said, this is to keep the lions away. They say, well, there are no lions in these parts. He says, ah, it's working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the, the point here is this. We act as though the, the church has to have this major sign of this is what we're doing and this is how we're helping the community. I'm not unique in this by any stretch of the imagination. This is the work of the church in this country every single day. Mm -hmm. There are pastors who are called upon and, and this is how we deal with issues in society in, in three basic ways. There are pastors who are called upon on a day-to-day -day basis to talk to people. We counsel people. We counsel people in crisis. We counsel people that are having marital issues, uh, where there are abuse issues or where there's infidelity issues or mm -hmm. whatever it is. There are marital issues. Um, there are people with uh, parental issues. You name it. All, all of these things that you see in society happening Every single day of the, of the calendar year, pastors are called upon to deal with these issues with parishioners one-on-one, -on -one, and sometimes persons outside of their flock on a one-on-one -on -one basis. The second way uh, we deal with this is, is from our pulpits. The messages that we preach uh, help to guide society in certain ways. And, and when I say society, I'm talking about those persons within our congregation. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that go out and live out uh, those, those messages. Mm -hmm. I, I have on any given week, uh, we have created a culture in our church where I have uh, persons who would email me and they would express to me how the message has benefited them and the life change that's taking place and the things that they're going to be doing differently. Mm -hmm. That happens every single week in every pulpit in this country, messages that penetrate the human heart, and as a result of that, it creates life change. That's a life change not because of some pressure from without, but because God is doing something in the heart of that individual, and so the change comes from inside out. Mm -hmm. That's the second way it happens. The third way it happens is through the church agitating uh, government to do certain things or to prevent certain things from happening. Uh, the church is, has a very strong voice in this nation, and I am so grateful that we are able to be salt and light in a nation that is godly. Mm. So those are the three ways that, that the church helps society in dealing with some of the issues that we face. 
Let's talk about um, a couple of the ones that you, you mentioned. Counseling, we, we understand that. So you are helping society to cope with some of the social issues, to cope maybe mental, religious, economic, family issues, straightforward. The messaging. When you look across the board, there is now a variety of churches, different type, non-denominational, and nothing is wrong with that. But you often hear, well, these days, you know, we don't preach the Bible anymore. We talk about prosperity, or this one talk about that, or back in the days, it was all he preaches about damnation. We don't want to hear. Is, is the message coming from the church, and we, we're using this broadly, and mm -hmm. obviously we're going to generalize here, but is the message coming from the church sufficiently has remained sufficiently grounded in traditional mores and values to help to keep the seams of society apart? Because, you know, they, they, there's tension. But is it sufficiently there, or has the church lost some of that thrust? I, I believe it's sufficiently there. You know, we, uh, and, and this, is, this is exactly what I'm talking about, we, we don't really fully appreciate the role that the church plays the scripture says it's the foolishness of preaching that save people. We, we, we look at a, a man or a woman of God mounting the pulpit on a Sunday morning and proclaiming the word of God. There is one common thread that you'll find in, in every Christian pulpit throughout the length and breadth of this nation, and that is the central theme of our message, who is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. that, that theme is going to be consistent from church to church. Our preaching styles are different. Um, our, our methodology is different. Our theology is even different. But you're going to find that consistent, redemptive message of Jesus Christ. That is, he's the one that's able to create life change. And that's the life change that I'm talking about. When that happens from inside out. Mm -hmm. um, some churches have a proclivity to preach on some subject matters more than others. That goes without saying. Um, now, here's the, here's the other thing that you didn't mention. Are there bad apples within the church? Yes, there are, there are bad apples. There, there, there are wolves in sheep clothing. There, there, there are pastors out there that are not doing right by their congregations. And you find that to be consistent uh, no, ma no matter where you go around the world mm -hmm. uh, among uh, pastors and preachers, but you'll also find that to be consistent no matter what industry you're looking at. Yeah. There are always going to be some bad apples, but they don't define the sum total of the impact that the church is making in our society. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, if you if you want to feel the pressures of, of the woes of society, remove the church from this Bahamas, and you would see nothing but chaos. You'll see nothing but uh, uh, hostility and every evil thing you can imagine. Yeah, the the intersection before we and we get into a break right right after this. The intersection between the church and politics, church and government, the impact that that has had over. Uh, any number of years, obviously, uh, as we uh, uh, where we started this conversation, we recognized that the church was fundamental in national development, in social movement, in the upliftment for the freedom of people, just um, them getting their rights, persons being able to be educated, to go to school, and so on and so forth. But time has evolved, and we have seen a number of instances where, maybe this is my style in, where the, the intersection between the church and politics comes with a question mark. Uh, there, 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 there's a sense in some instances that pastors uh, stepped across the line, levied or leveraged their influence in a manner which is unchristian. My, my word. <laughs> One of the things, and, and I've been consistent with this, one of the things I've shared with our congregation is I'll never wear my politics on my sleeves. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say that because I, I, I want to be very, very... Um, you have a politics? I think as human beings and as citizens of any country, we better have a politics. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But it's, it's important for me not to wear mine on my sleeve. Mm -hmm. So I've had people walk into me and says, you know... Uh, we thought you were this, but then you look like you more like that. Mm -hmm. And then they come from the other side and say, we thought you were that, but now you look more like us. We, we, we don't understand where you are. And I say, well, good. That means that I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And, and I'm that way intentionally because I do want to be able to reach 
people, period, regardless of their politics. Mm -hmm. Now, that's my personal position. Others, uh, other pastors have other personal positions where they wear their politics on their sleeves. Um, do they do they talk about politics from from the pulpit? Yes, they do. Is it something they shouldn't do? I'm not the judge of that, uh, but I will tell no, you. No, no, but no, no, no. I, I, For Pastor Mario, uh, to be, let's be, let, let, let let's be, you know, open and frank. If uh, the nature of politics in and of itself, right, tends to be very divisive, can be very divisive. Uh, a pastor, from my perspective, a leader of a church is an individual who ought to be working in such a way where he is becoming, pulling people together. If at some point in time he leverages, he or she leverages, and lean significantly in one direction or the other, is there not something wrong with that? Is, is, is there, you know, a, a pastor may come out and bluntly or almost bluntly say to people, vote for X or vote for Y. Wouldn't that be a part of the reason why the church is, in some instance, losing its moral influence on society? One, one doesn't necessarily have to do with the other when it comes to moral influence. Okay. Because many of the pastors that I know that are heavily involved in politics have very strong morals. Mm. And that, those morals are never compromised. The, politics never goes beyond the morals of that, of that pastor. Um, when, you, when you listen to them in that pulpit, it, and that's what I'm talking about, the message that we have is a very redemptive message. It's the message of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Pastors don't compromise that for politics. Mm -hmm. uh, they have their politics, but they're not going to compromise that central message because uh, unlike other professions, when it comes to being a pastor, this is a calling. This is not uh, mama call and papa sent type in, of scenario. In, in, in some instances, it's not. In, in, in many instances, uh, uh, it is. <laughs> it is a calling. No, uh, I, 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 we're saying the same uh, thing. Yeah, I, I know, but it, it sounds different when I say <laughs> yes. it the other way around. <laughs> right, okay, yeah. <laughs> in many instances, it, it, is, a, it is a calling, mm -hmm. and, and pastors are very committed to that calling. Yeah. They don't compromise that for anything in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, they do have their politics. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's why I cannot wrong them. I cannot judge any pastor when it comes to that sort of thing. I have taken a personal position because that's me. Mm -hmm. um, but I've known pastors who are heavy into one camp and have this incredible ability to bridge the gap between both camps. Right. So that's a gifting, and, and it happens. And, and both camps understand exactly the nature, and, and they all get along. They, we, we have to be... Bahamians, um, we have to be Christians first, Bahamians second, and then we carry our political banner third. <laughs> and definitely, and so at the art of that has to be about the people. And so if the if the church is helping the people to move forward, helping the people to grow, helping the people to develop, then certainly it is doing that. If the individual is out there being involved on a social level, being involved on a political level, and maintain the morals and keep the, the principles strong, then certainly that is something that we can tolerate. But the moment that you act in a way which is going to be divisive and is going to denigrate any of those things that we just spoke about, then obviously Pastor Mario will frown upon you. You're listening <laughs> to The Essentials. This is Hubert Edwards, and we're having a conversation with Mr. Mario Moxie, Pastor Mario Moxie, the son of Ed Moxie. I have to get that in there. Certainly on the other side, if you want to have a conversation very quickly, very short, the numbers are 323-6232, 325 4316, 325-4259, our text line 422-4796. When we come back on the other side, we want to hear from Pastor Mario exactly how he sees the church helping the country to move forward in the next 50. Don't move. Come right back. The new 
Guardian Radio app is here. Listen live to all our Guardian Radio shows and live video stream select programs in our studio. Get information about Guardian Radio shows and our hosts. Send messages including text, email, and even call. All from our amazing new Guardian Radio app. Download it free today in your app store for your Apple device or Play Store for your Android device. The all new and improved Guardian Radio app. Love the show? Want to give your support? Become a sponsor today. Call 302-2300 for our rates and packages. That's 302-2300. Become a sponsor on Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day. Next Level Solutions. Next Level Solutions. Solutions. At Next Level Solutions, we assist companies and organizations to understand and strategically resolve governance, risk, compliance, regulatory, finance, and operational challenges, maximize their performance, and grow. Next Level Solutions, a dynamic consultancy built on experiential knowledge. For further details on our service offerings, visit nlsolutionsbahamas.com or call 376-8951 Next Level Solutions Practical Solutions Delivered Always on the go? Miss the show? You can now listen to Guardian Radio talk shows anytime, anywhere on Spotify and YouTube by searching Guardian Radio 96.9 FM or by entering the name of your favorite show. You can also listen by logging on to GuardianTalkRadio.com and clicking on the podcast tab. Guardian Radio, continuing to provide you with fresh news and smart talk anywhere, anytime, all day. This is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day. Lord, where you think this man is, man? All day I've been home with these little baby kids. And he was from here. Huh? Well, anyway, I can fall down the road to see if he's down. I just think down the road. And if he's down there, there's going to be some problems. And ladies and gentlemen, we are in the studio with Pastor Mario Moxie. You're listening to the song. These are the songs you would have been hearing in Jumbe Village on an ongoing basis. <laughs> These are the songs which would have enriched the Over the Hill community. would have uh, thousands and thousands, if not millions, of tourists making their way to the mecca of cultural experience in the Bahamas. We have to make that connection because we're in studio with the son of the man, the cultural icon, Ed Moxie. And so as we get into celebrating the 50th uh, year of independence, we must give a nod to him. He fought hard. He worked hard. His dream didn't come true, but he left a blueprint. And maybe one day, somewhere along the line, Someone will pick that up again, and we will move that forward. We have a caller on the line. Caller, go ahead. Uh, let's get to your contribution quickly. A pleasant good afternoon, Mr. Edwards. A pleasant good afternoon to you, Sparky. A pleasant good afternoon to Pastor Mario Moxie. Good afternoon, sir. I know your father very well, old muscle and guts. Yes. And old Mr. Edwards, I don't know if you're around, but I'm a 72-year-old man. Mm-hmm. One time ago, we used to call that area not the Grove, but Coconut Grove. Right. Uh, I hung out with his father many times with the guys in the evening, and he'd always carry around his little tin cup. Mm-hmm. He did like a glass or a plastic cup. He loved his love, one of the old can, take the top off, and that's what he'd drink his drinks out of. Mm-hmm. <laughs> remember that, Roxy? <laughs> and you remember what he used to say before? <laughs> No, no, I don't remember everything. <laughs> uh, my my grandfather uh, used to do that. Uh, they call him God bless. Oh yeah, uh, one God bless, one does muscle and God. That's right. So they used to, <laughs> yeah, they, used, you know, they used to drink out the can and, and take their finger and, and 
dip the, the liquid in the can mm -hmm. and sprinkle it on the ground for all the fellas who went before. Yeah, them. that's what we do. We get them there. We pour it pour in the ground for all the brothers that went before yeah. us. Yes. Yeah, that, that's, don't, don't pour all your beer. Just a drop. Yeah, but, that comes but, from people who appreciate the but you issue see, of Mr. Um, Mr. 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 Um, Edwards, there's yeah. so much history, Bahamian history. Mm -hmm. That for some reason, we... Our leaders, for some reason, they, they deceive the Bahamian people by not telling us our history. That, um, that area down at the back there, Gumbe Village, Jumbe Village, when that was built in Coconut Grove, before that was the, 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 the Jumbe Village, that was actually the city dump here. Mm -hmm. The city dump used to be that area before they moved it out west by Prospect Ridge out the back there. Okay. Right across the road, the Super Value was, was also the Count Shell Club. You know, Mr. Mo. Along that strip, there was always churches and bars. And tourists used to come over the hill, sometimes in a horse and carriage. Sometimes on motorbikes or bicycles and everything. One time ago, that's how beautiful this little country was. Mm. They were not limited to just Montague Beach, the, the Queen Staircase and fish fry and so forth the way they are now. The tourists actually used to travel the this little beautiful island which you all call Nassau. When I was growing up it was the whole New Providence. Mm -hmm. We never had no Nassau International Airport. We had Oaksville Airport. We call it Nassau International Airport, but no airport was ever in Nassau. And people passed out these lies and children don't even know where they go, they don't know that Nassau is only a city down Bay Street. Mm -hmm. Between Nassau Street and Church Street, West, between the Dolphin Hotel and Church Street, where I'm saying Matthews is, along Shirley Street to the North Waterfront, is the city of Nassau. Yes. Yep. We tell our teachers, our children in school, that the island named Nassau, the island is named New Providence. Yeah, we got you. People coming from the out island say they come into Nassau, they come into New Providence. When we were taught in school to fill out a, a letter to set off, if you were living in Fox Hill, your letter said Fox Hill Post Office, not Nassau for Post Office. <laughs> All right, if, Parky, you... Uh, you know, but see what I'm saying, this, Mr. Day? Um, his father's dream mm -hmm. was all of our dream. We used to love to go down there, especially on weekends. Yeah. That was like a fairground. Yeah. Do you know also there was a song written for Joe Bay Village by none other than the leader of the Saxons, Willa Francis. Okay. The song named Joe May Village. Yeah. You know, Willa Francis wrote that. Willa Francis sung that. Your, your producer could bring that song up any time. Definitely. We'll try and get that. And certainly, um, Sparky, before but we I end... Said, hold, on, hold on, hold on, Sparky, before we end the series, because I want to get in some more discussion with Pastor Mario. Um, but I wanted next, to ask him a question. Okay, go ahead and ask a question. Mr. Mr. See, I disagree with you also, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Moxie, in regards to when we come to religion. You mentioned something about politics, Christianity... And and, 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 and and being Bahamian. But the preamble from the uh, or the const or the our constitution was told to me by A.D. Hunter himself that during the time of that very serious election, Pastor Brown upon Meeting Street, like you said, the politicians and the religious leaders were closely identified with the people. But it was um, mandated by Bishop Brown. And he told them, if they didn't put Christianity in there, they would tell the people in the churches not to vote for the PLP. But the PLP wanted to win so bad, they, they put that in there. But remember in the Constitution, we have freedom of religion in the Bahamas. You don't have to tell me who grew up in the Anglican Church, baptized in 1951 in St. Matthews, grew up until the age of 19, 20, whatever it is, served on the altar as a Christian, put on me by my parents, Without my permission. Yeah. When I was a child, I spoke to a child. When I got married, I could make my, my All decisions. All right, Sparky, you have to tighten up the question, though. Uh, what the but question you is. You can't tell me that we must be Bahamians. We have the right to have any religion we want to have. Okay, appreciate it. Thanks so Thank much you. for your contribution. And, you know, this is a free country, and you have a right to do that. But I don't think 
I, I think he kind of missed the message a little bit there, Pastor Mario. Well, you know, he, he spoke about he spoke about the Constitution, and um, in that Constitution, it talks about us being a, uh, a nation of Christian values, and mm -hmm. I think that's a very important statement. He also mentioned mentioned the, the Honorable Lady Hannah. Um, you know, the Honorable Lady Hannah was in the presence of two pastors um, while he was at Government House as as GG, and um, mentioned to them that the framers of our Constitution actually wanted to make the Bahamas a Christian nation and recognize that they could not do that because the, the tent needed to be wide enough mm -hmm. to embrace everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and so what they did was the work around that was to put in the preamble that we have Christian values as right. opposed to a Christian, opposed to nation. Christian nation. Um, so it, it's very important that we, we understand that, mm -hmm. that, that our country is built on Christian Values, values, mm -hmm. values that are centered around Christ. That doesn't necessarily mean that everyone in the country are Christians. Um, by all means, we have freedom of religion. You can be whatever religion or non-religion you want you choose to be. Mm -hmm. But this country is based on Christian uh, values. Mm -hmm. Hence the reason why the church, uh, we become the guardians of that aspect of the Constitution to ensure that our legislation aligns itself with what we have determined that, that it's going to be. Christian uh, values. Christian values. Maintenance of ecclesiastic approach. The, in the, some ways. The, the maintenance of redemption, redemption of Jesus Christ. Because it's not about a church. <laughs> it's about Jesus Christ. <laughs> we have a caller on the line. Caller, go ahead. You have a question for Pastor Mario Moxie? Yeah, good afternoon. Good, um, good a, afternoon. A, comment, a question and a quick comment. Yeah, go as ahead. Far as, as far as the preamble of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. That is not really actually part of the Constitution. I yeah, think we, I know we, legal we, we understand. That's why it's called a preamble. Yeah, that's right. why it's so, a preamble. So, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it, it doesn't carry any legal weight. There's a lot of people that say that we are a Christian nation, but there ain't no declaration in the Constitution saying that. Yeah. As Pastor Mario right. rightly says, it's a right. constitution so, so, no, I think built some people will, on... A lot of people use that phrase that we are a Christian nation. Okay. Good. Okay. We got and, you. And... The, the, the question that I have for him is that what about all the other religious religions in the country? Because yeah. Christianity, they also walk on the different branches of Christianity. Yeah. So that's um, where the problem is coming for a lot of people because they have people who proclaim to be Anglican, Catholics. Mm -hmm. I mean, the country that we, that, that used to oversee us, they had a state religion. And that was the Anglican Church. Mm -hmm. It was Anglican. And that is how come the city of Nassau, I think, got to be a city of Nassau because it had a cathedral. Correct. Yeah. In order, in order so, to have so, a, so, a, in order a, for a capital. To be a, a city under the British. A capital, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what we came under. So the, the thing about it, when we speak about Christianity, we have a lot of Christian denominations. So which ones is supposed to uphold the guiding light for the country, all yeah. is supposed to be doing that. I know, I know the answer, but I mean, I just, okay. Like, let's hear what Pastor Mario, Mario have, to have to say, and as you yes, as you reflect on answering that, you know, what about the Rastaman? What about the Muslim? What about the Baha'i? What about how how does the religious community of which you are a part of, and certainly one of the leaders in it, how how do you interact? Are there any interactions um, as we as we seek to build a more cohesive and you know integrated country? You know, we talk about cohesion um, as though we, there aren't boundaries. Christianity have boundaries. Mm. And it isn't anything that we, we shy away from. Um, within every law, there's discrimination. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, that's why the, the Marriage Matrimonial Causes Act in this country is so important because it discriminates. It discriminates against certain people, you know. Um, but we can have a later conversation. Uh, I, and I think we talked about the fact that when we talk about the preamble of the Constitution, we mentioned Christian values, mm -hmm. that the Bahamas has, uh, the intent there is that the tent is, is big enough and wide enough to encompass everyone. It's not that everyone in the country have to be a Christian, um, but it's that we are guided by such principles of Christianity. Some, mm -hmm. And, and those, those principles are not based on a denomination or any one particular church, but based on Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And that, that he becomes the guiding light for our country. And it's very important that we understand that because the moment we begin to reject him and we insult our nation, we say we no longer want Jesus Christ to be our guiding light, 
then that comes with certain consequences as well. Mm -hmm. On July 10th, we will celebrate 50 years as an independent country, the Bahamas will. As you glance back up to now, have there been any development which you would consider to be a major misstep in, in, the, in, in the country's um, journey? When I, when I think back at missteps that we would have made, um, recently, you know, since we've been talking about the road to 50 and mm. th there have been a lot of conversations, I remember being part of, um, I, I, think, I think this was one of the groups that you, you had, um, one of the leadership groups that you had mm -hmm. that I was part of. Uh, this, is, this would have been a couple of years ago. Um, something happened within the government and I made the comment that our politicians are young, <laughs> you know, they're not, they're not, they're not fully developed. And boy, some people got on me with that because they figured, you know, you get into politics, you should have all the answers and know what to do and, mm -hmm. and never fumble the ball. Um, and that I was making excuse for leaders and leaders are beyond, re uh, re um, mistakes, mm -hmm. which of course is not the truth. So when I think of, of our nation, I don't see it through the lens that, that perhaps people see it in such rigid ways. I, I see it from the perspective of we're a growing nation. 50 years may seem like a long time, but it's a very short time. Mm -hmm. And so we're still learning some things. Uh, you know, we're still, we're still learning how to wear leadership mm -hmm. from the perspective of it, it takes some time. You yeah. know, I've, I've been pastoring uh, for over 27 years now, but the person that I am today have evolved when I first started. Um, I've, I've gone through some battles, I've had some scars, I've learned some lessons. I now know that I don't know um, a lot of things. When I was younger, you know, I thought I knew everything. Mm. Um, I, I used to tell my son, you need to solve all the world problems before you reach 18 while you still know everything. Mm -hmm. Because the moment you reach 18, obviously you don't know nothing. <laughs> um, but that's how life is. True. We, we look back and we can see that we've made some missteps, mm -hmm. and those missteps may have been because of our youth. Yeah. But it, isn't, isn't that a part of the maturity? Coming to the recognition that you don't know all things, you don't need to be all things, and isn't it an inflection point where effective leadership should then work to bring together those others who are able to bring value to whatsoever well, needs before to be they, solved. Before they can even do that, they need to be able to admit that they've made some mistakes yeah. and they've fumbled the ball and, and, and here is where I've gone wrong and this is what I'm going to do to correct that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but politically, we haven't seen that. And, and, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be honest with you. Um, my father was victimized and that's the reason why Jumbe Village is no more. Um, but there's never been a, a reconciliation of that. And, mm. and I wish that there was. Now, there have, been, there have been private conversations that have had, that have been had, mm -hmm. where people said, yeah, we, we probably made some mistakes there. Yeah, but not a public but, but not vindication. Nothing, not, no public vindication related mm -hmm. to that. My father had a, a very tough, uh, a hardship of a life uh, be, due to the, the level of victimization that he had. Mm -hmm. um, you know, me being a Christian, uh, of course, I don't have any animosity, any bitterness in my heart or anything. And, and I know that before my father passed away, neither did he. Mm. Um, he, had, he had left all of that behind and, and he was in his glory years when he came to the twilight season of his life and his final passing. Mm -hmm. So, but, but I see that as us developing as a country. I see that as us, as us maturing. And so we can look back and say, yeah, there's some things that we did that, that we should do differently. Yeah. Um, I've spoken to the, the nation leaders who've said, you know, there's some things I, I did that I wish I didn't do, right. former leaders of our nation. So we, we all recognize these things. Um, and I'm for one, I give way to that because I do understand that. There are things in my life as a leader, um, you know, when people say, man, if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change a thing. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think, man, they haven't learned anything, anything. because right. I have learned so much from the mistakes that mm -hmm. I've made yeah. as, as a leader yeah. and mistakes that I'm still making today. I had a conversation with a young lady who 
when she and her husband were going through something, and I talked about the fact that we can't some people, but mm. we, don't, we don't always do that perfectly right. because this was an instance where that didn't happen. Um, I dropped the ball in that situation. Her husband ended up getting a divorce. And, and you know, divorce for anyone is a very painful process. Right. Um, and she came back to me and she told me that I dropped the ball. Let me tell you something. There, there is nothing more more painful than coming to grips with the fact that you failed. Mm -hmm. um, but I've made a determination that I won't allow that to happen again. So I've learned from that. Um, I was embarrassed by it. Mm -hmm. I, uh, this is the first time I've even talking about it publicly. Yeah, you do You do I, that a lot on the essentials. I don't know why you don't come here more often. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I've apologized to her. Yeah. And, and I've, I've explained to her how, embarrass, how embarrassing it is. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, the marriage institution is such an important institution. Yeah. Um, but we don't always get things right as leaders. And right. we, we need to be able to show grace um, to others when, they, when they're messing up and cut them some slack. Yeah. And it's not that we're giving them a pass or anything like that. It's just that we recognize that sometimes we don't get it right. We just don't get it right. And as a society, we need to be able to allow our political leaders to make the mistakes and, and give them this, the, the space that they need to make those mistakes mm -hmm. with, without condemning them, without hounding them, without worrying about the next political cycle mm -hmm. because we don't develop. A, a development as a nation is slowed down because of it. Yeah. With one caveat, though, we would ask for them to be open, to be vulnerable, Correct. to be humbled by the moment, which therefore caused there to be learning. And in that learning, then they create value for the nation. Do we under celebrate our achievements? Yes, we we certainly do. I've I've had some experiences in life that has taught me some some things. Um, every July, for example, we celebrate all things Bahamian at our church. Mm -hmm. We've been doing this for years, and it must have been over fifteen years ago. We were having one of these celebrations. I invited Painis Taylor to come to our church to play the bongos. Um, before he came, of course, I did my research, and so I was introducing him, and I began to share his life story of Paul Mears and, and the influence of Paul Mears mm -hmm. and how he got started, and I showed a clip of him on CBS, a black and white a clip, and as I'm doing this, I'm watching this man who's sitting on the front row begin to be broken, and I can see, visibly see that he's shaken by this. He's broken by it. He's getting yeah. emotional, and I'm on the platform looking at him, and I'm bring, bring, getting ready to bring him up on the platform to play his bongos, but he's in no condition to do it. Mm. I mean, he, he graciously comes up, and we talk a little bit, and then he goes back down to his seat because I, I gave him a way out of it, right? But it made me realize that, because he said to me, he says, he didn't realize that people knew that, that his story was, mm -hmm. was known and, and I recognize that here's a man who has given his life. Under appreciation. And, and he's at the twilight of his age, and he isn't sure whether or not people will remember him. Mm. When my father released his documentary, The Price of Being a Man, he was, uh, this was at University of the Bahamas in the theater, and um, he disappeared minutes before we, we began the, the showing. And I went looking for him. I found him on the side of the building. And I said, Dad, you know what's happening? You disappeared. He was crying. He said, Mario, my story will finally be told. That was the second instance I had. And I realized that people get to a place in this country where they don't know whether or not their stories will be told. That became the, the impetus for us to have the Edmund Moxie Cultural Awards at our church. Mm -hmm. We recognize individuals who have contributed to this nation who are 65 and over. And um, last year, we had the opportunity to um, uh, recognize Bahamian, uh, Isaiah Taylor and Bahamian for their contribution. Again, that is a group of individuals who are not recognized, who've done so much for this country mm -hmm. um, by the songs that they sing and the way they represent the Bahamas globally. Um, Michael Sweet Bell Thompson, he was at our church to receive the award. Of course, all the Baha men were there mm -hmm. uh, last year. This year, we're re recognizing the Honorable, Right Honorable Perry Christie, along with several others. Walla Francis will be one of those individuals that we'll recognize as well. And, and this is just so that 
these individuals know that we remember them, we appreciate them, we, we're grateful. And from the time we've been doing this, the response have been so consistent and I've always been moved. And, and the team that works with us in doing this, when they do the tapings and the recordings of these life stories, um, they're moved by it because this, this is our culture. This is who we are as a people. Yeah, this is telling the story of a people. Through, through the lens of persons who dare to step out further and beyond where most other persons go. But in doing that, they reflect the lives of those who, who are behind. Exactly. So, yes, we need to be able to state our accomplishments and say, this is what we've done because it inspires the next generation. Yes. Behind us, um, the, the young people that, that comes out to these shows, they, they walk away. I spoke to a couple of them last, last year. Um, and they were like, I didn't know this about our country. I didn't know that, that Michael Sweet Bell Thompson was the first uh, non-American drafted, number drafted one. In, in, in NBA. You know, these, these are stories that people just don't know. Yeah, and, 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 and these are important achievements. So when you, when you appreciate, as we started the show, you talk about the gatherings, your family gatherings. That presented a grounding for you, something that you can be proud of, something that you do not at the time recognize. But over the course of your life, you, you come to realize it created a foundation on which you build. When we celebrate these things and allow them to seep into the psyche of the country, seep into the psyche of young people, seep into the psyche of individuals, all of a sudden, maybe not 100,000, maybe ten. But that 10 is going to then turn around and influence another 100, and that 100, another 200, and so on and so forth. We need to do more of that. Oftentimes, in my view, and this is my personal position, I think the, the, the celebrations in the Bahamas are too politically centric. By politically centric, I mean the, the figures that get celebrated much too often are those who emanate from the political class. Your thoughts? I, I completely agree. Um, and there needs to be a greater effort to create the independence um, of, and again, you know, politics being as youthful as it is, mm -hmm. and when I say that, it's only been 50 years yes. in the country, as yeah. youthful as it is, we still see things on a five-year cycle. When I look at our country, um, we live in a, an, an, an archipelagic nation which has always been seen as a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. I see it as a major advantage in the future because we have this incredible opportunities with, with all of our family islands to have our, uh, every family island has its own brand, mm -hmm. its own signature, its own voice. And uh, we're able to develop that. You know, if tourists is going to be the thing that we get into, and we are very good at it, um, we can take that to the zenith of its potential. We can, we can maximize that uh, to, to the nth degree, uh, but we, we have to be able to see all of these opportunities that I believe God has given us in this country yeah. and, and capitalize on it. Yeah. You need to be able to see the design behind the bark yes. being stripped off. Yes. It's important. It is important. It's important. To see the next. And so being a youthful nation, mm -hmm. we, we, we oftentimes don't look 50 years down the road, we only see five-year cycles. Too short term. And, and it's very short to build anything in five years. Definitely. We will get to the point eventually where we begin to understand that maybe we do need to have some long-term planning. Mm -hmm. Our political leaders, I don't think they have the stomach for it right now. They don't have the appetite for it right now. They know that it should be done, but the, the culture, the climate, and the desire to get into the office in the next five years is trumped. Trump's that. Yeah, it will come. We have a call on the line. Caller, go ahead quickly as we get to the end of the show. This advert, I'll go very quickly, but it seemed like Brother Moxie was breaking up. I was trying. I, th I hear you very clearly, but I'm not hearing him. You're not hearing him very clearly? clearly. No, okay. not at all. Because he was talking and then he was breaking up. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it was happening there. Yeah, sorry about that. Maybe he's but, uh, moving Pastor around Moxie, a little bit afternoon. too much. Good afternoon. I hope all is well with you. Good afternoon, sir. And I, you sound better now. And I think you're being quite frank. I am saddened by the fact that they had um, discriminated against your father. I know he did very well for John Ruby Village. He was way ahead of his time, and it was something that was very refreshing at the time. 
Now, as far as our political leaders are concerned, they committed national sins. There's no such thing as no missteps. I think as a pastor, you have to tell it from the way it is. Isaiah 16, verse 1, where you're commanded by God to cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, show my people, that's us who are Christians, their transgressions, and the house of Jacob, the Commonwealth of Bahamas, their sins. We have not been doing that, and the government of the Bahamas has never admitted to committing any national sin in its 50 years. A lot of damage, Pastor Moxie and Mr. Edwards, were done to the Bahamian people. All we got to do is look at Article 6 of our Constitution, which is the clearest article on citizenship. And the government of the Bahamas has messed up big time. This current administration is not even interested in referendums. You can only change Article 6 by a referendum. In fact, all the articles uh, relating to citizenship can be changed by a referendum. But let me say this in closing. I believe moving forward, first thing we got to do is repent. And the Constitution does not discriminate. Now, I didn't hear Pastor Marx say it does discriminate, but he mentioned about, I think he mentioned about marriage. The scriptures do not discriminate. Now, you may disagree. The scriptures are supreme. The Constitution is supreme. Other laws could discriminate because you have to look at those laws in light of your supreme law. Mm -hmm. Anything that is supreme cannot discriminate. And because of the fact that the type Constitution we have, these other people have these other funny things. The Constitution allows for freedom of religion. So they don't have a beef with us, but they're trying to beat down Christianity and get rid of it and get rid of God, then the Constitution says we are under the supremacy of God, which simply means there are some things we cannot accept. Let me okay. stop right there. Thank you so, so much. Can move forward. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, much for, for your effort. contribution. Appreciate you calling him. And okay. you know, he, he said quite a, 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 a bit past the Mario. Um, the, I think the point you made was that there are laws, and every rules have its own set of discriminatory things. We, we, we accept that. Um, we're running out of time, so we have to get to our last word. Those are important. As you look to the next 50, first of all, we're going to celebrate on the 10th. That's going to be a big thing. It's going to be uh, huge. A, a huge um, celebration. But the next 50, the next five years after, the next 10 years after, what is it that you want to see as one of the leaders in this country? How do you want to see the church being involved in the next phase of the development of um, the Bahamas? I would like to see the church in this, in this country really be the guiding light for not just our political leaders, uh, but also for our civic leaders. Mm -hmm. Uh, from a political, an economic, a social perspective, uh, God has given us the blueprint on on not just spiritual matters, but in all matters. And there is yet to be a nation um, that would follow the, the plan and the purposes for God. I believe we could be that nation. I believe that we can be a nation that's in tune to the voice of God and trust God in every circumstances we have leaned on man's ingenuity. We have leaned on man's intellect. And um, we, need to, we need to be able to shift our faith, our faith to arise on the inside of us and begin to look to God. And, and I, I close with this one scripture that Paul told Timothy. He says, if any provide not for his own, especially those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. An infidel is an unbeliever. It's a person who relies on their own natural ability to lead them and to guide them as opposed to relying on God. There needs to be a God consciousness in this nation from the top down where we, are, we respect the authority and the sovereignty of God. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that our politicians have to attend our churches. Uh, when we look throughout the scripture, those that did right in the eyes of God, prospered. And, and that's what I would like to see in our nation, that we do right in the eyes of God in all of our laws, and uh, there will be great prosperity. I see this nation as being a very prosperous place uh, spiritually, that we can take this message of Jesus Christ and we can, we can deliver this message throughout the length and breadth of this world. You have this 
program, very quickly, you have this program in Harvest Church, referred to as Good Deeds. How do you see that as a microcosm of what the country needs from a social perspective that is going to aid us in the next part of the journey? You know, you mentioned that just today before I came here, we, we did an outreach at the Princess Margaret Hospital. Yesterday, we did it at the Sandlands Rehabilitation Center. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to speak with the director of the Sandlands Rehabilitation Center, Sister uh, Russell. And uh, again, today at, at, at Princess Margaret Hospital, where we, we you know, we're, we're giving, we're constantly giving. When we do this, one of the interesting things that I see is how our partnership, how it impacts the staff in these places, that it, it breeds light into them. And this idea that they're not alone, that, that there are people that are thinking about them, that care about them. And the same thing with patients. They told me yesterday, they said, you know, those, those roses that you give to the men, they're going to hold on to those until they wither away. Um, act of kindness has a way of changing lives and changing hearts. And what do we do? It spills over because everyone in that influence, they see it but they feel it and they pass it on to others. Uh, I, I so desire that so many others will do likewise. Mm -hmm. we, we have to, you know, and Paul says, if anyone doesn't provide, he isn't just talking about material things. That word provide means to have foreknowledge or have a plan that we'll be able to see this incredible plan for our nation, that we all can come together as brothers and sisters in humanity and in unity. And, and that answers the bell when it comes to immigration and everything else. We have to be humane and we have to be united. And united doesn't mean that we all say the same thing, we all do the same thing, but it means that our hearts and our compassion is wide enough that we can embrace our brothers and sisters regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their background, regardless of their economic uh, status. So that's the Bahamas that I see. That's the Bahamas that you see. And you are, in essence, living out this thing, which we always talk about. I am because you are. we are mm -hmm. the Ubuntu pastor. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to the son of the man who someone described as he had some properly seasoned boil fish running through his veins, the dirt from Ragged Islands anchoring his feet, and the sweet sound of of goatskin drum, he the saw and the accordion running through his head. He, as he saluted the Bahamian flag, paying allegiance to no other country on this earth, he fought for it until the day he died. Ed Moxie personified the true, true Bahamian. Thank you so much for being here, Pastor. Thank you so much Mario for inviting Moxie. me. And so all that's left to say is, as we usually say, do not allow your greatness to become a victim of your unwillingness to change. We have been listening to The Essentials, The Reset. I'm your host, Hubert Edwards. Join us next week. All that is left to say is walk good, one love, and Ubuntu. Good night. A landlord, Louisiana, Alcatraz, and Soda, and Mr. The World. Say this word. Make a new summer, it's ugly, and love is lovely. Change our feet.